Hi, I'm Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, and welcome to day six of Dezine 15, a digital festival celebrating Dezine's 15th birthday. We asked 15 creatives from around the world to come up with ideas for how to change the world over the next 15 years. Over the coming days, they'll all be presenting their manifestos for a better world. Today, we're speaking with Lara Lesmes and Frederick Helberg, founders of design and research practice Space Popular, about their ideas. Hi, Lara. Hi, Frederick. Hello. Hey, Marcus. Good to see you. Good to see you're looking very bright today. <laughs> Thank you. Putting me to shame in my gloomy black. Tell me, <laughs> where are you? You look like you're in some kind of cave on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> You were in a public square in a public square in the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very intriguing. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Where are you from? What do you do? Where are you based? Just give me a quick um, overview of, of yourselves and your work. Yeah, well, so I'm Lara Lesmes. I, I, I'm from Spain. Um, and I'm Fredrik Helberg from Sweden. And um, our practice, um, as you said, is called Space Popular. And we are architects, but the majority of our work is engaged with uh, not necessarily uh, physical architecture, but more the emerging um, virtual environments, um, or uh, often referred to as the metaverse, and how that will affect human culture, human experience, uh, etc. And right now we are um, half in a virtual environment, but also in the north of Spain, where our studio is based this year. And you do do normal architecture as well. You build houses and, and other projects. But as you said, you've, you've made your name as kind of pioneers of, of thinking about the metaverse, the digital realm as a, as a space where architecture can take place, or if not architecture, something that almost kind of um, echoes the real world. Tell us a little bit more about that work and, and, and why it's needed. Yeah, I mean, we're interested in, in any means of... Um... Of building spatial experiences and we think that all of that is architecture um, and in fact the criteria that we use is quite similar uh, for something that would be built with bricks and mortar and something that would be built with pixels. <laughs> um, we feel it's very uh, important uh, that architects, designers, planners, um, anyone that has been, that has been trained in, in, in building spaces and building spaces of quality and of comfort and with uh, with, with people's interests um, at heart, it gets involved in, in what's coming. Um, and basically what's coming is uh, a three-dimensional version of the internet as we know it today. And that three-dimensional version of the internet will uh, have a lot of issues to resolve. Um, some that are of like almost uh, legal nature or uh, of uh, regulatory nature. Um, and some that are very much about designing and understanding what does it mean to be comfortable? Um, what does it mean to create environments of quality uh, in such place? When you say we're moving towards a, a three-dimensional version of the internet, you mean that instead of it being two-dimensional pages, that it actually gives the impression that there are physical spaces that we can inhabit? Yeah, at, at the core of basically all of our work in this field, both the ones that are actually for clients, like virtual environments for conferences and things, but also the speculative work and works like we will be presenting today. We believe and we work with the assumption that by the middle of the 21st century, so by 2050, all media will be spatial. So we will no longer have smartphones or laptops and monitors and screens like this. All media, even watching a sitcom, will be done uh, in, a, in an immersive environment. So considering that, we are that's already happening, of course, through VR devices and things like this, but it is slowly, slowly happening. And increasingly, we will uh, stop buying smartphones uh, and stop buying monitors, et cetera, and be literally inside of the medium. So how will, if you're inside a 3D space, how do you consume like, movies or text or something like that if you don't have a screen to... A traditional screen to look at it on. Yeah, I mean, I guess we will, will probably uh, there will be recreations um, of those screens, and that's why we think also that perhaps the, the most interesting part at the moment of creating these kinds of environments is that they allow you to be together with other people in a way that is quite natural, because it's spatial, right? So the way you hear people, uh, the way you can approach them and talk to them, the way you can feel closeness, um, is quite natural, even if they are remote. 
um, as opposed to perhaps that, that is the bit that is really missing in the two-dimensional version that we access today. However, the, the sort of paper sheet format um, is not going to go away. It's, it's very convenient for certain things. So I think we will begin to see uh, a sort of integration of uh, the formats as we know them, the sort of paper sheet format or the screen format into this virtual realm and then bit by bit start to understand um, where are the qualities that the three-dimensional environments are really bringing forward. Of course, during the, the pandemic, when we last spoke, in fact, there was a, a surge of interest in the metaverse and virtual uh, networking because it was the only thing that we could do. Um, but generally, AR and VR and metaverse-like environments, have, have they've been promising so much for so long, but they've been a little bit slow to deliver. What's happened in the last year since the, the pandemic forced us all to engage with things like Zoom? In a way, the, the biggest thing that happened is a change in public perception, which is essential for this for, for any of these things to, to move forward. Um, there have also been a lot of things that have happened on the side of the technology itself, which, um, as you said, has been moving very slowly. This is often referred to as the third or the fourth wave of VR, where there has been many careers and many companies that died and disappeared decades ago <laughs> when people thought that now we're finally going to live inside a spatial medium. Um, yeah, I would say definitely, especially with the recent announcement by a certain company that everyone probably is aware of uh, with Facebook rebranding to Meta. Certainly these kind of things have been happening several times throughout the, the pandemic and also with us working with clients, like um, in some cases, uh, people that are very involved and knows about these things, but it also very, very commercial clients that have no idea what a virtual environment is. And we realized that just after a few months of the pandemic, uh, the vast majority of people were all of a sudden aware that this has at least existed, which makes a huge, huge difference. Last year, I think it was, you you designed the, the first ever architecture conference to take place in a, a virtual space. I was talking to someone on the weekend who was saying, he's a conference organ, he said, I like real world conferences and I like virtual conferences, but hybrid conferences, oh my God, they're such a, such a, such a problem. Where is that kind of, that kind of side of things going, do you think? Yeah, well, that is where I think, For that's one perfect example of, um, of where architects and designers fit in, no? how do we do these things well? And um, how are we not holophobic? <laughs> we always like to use this word. It's actually from Rick and Morty, which is hilarious, but it describes so well um, what happens so much sometimes when you don't uh, you, you don't open up uh, for people who is remote to be able to join, right? And often everything happens in a metropolis, and and many people does not have access to that. So it is tricky, uh, right, to create these um, hybrid environments and it relies on on the technology that is used and how it has been used so i think it relies heavily on on design and how do we think of those joining remotely not as secondary but as equally primary and how do you work with what there is um, also understanding that devices are um, in constant development um, so eventually we'll turn into some kind of everyone has their headset in one way or another um, so that we can all be actually together. Uh, but at the moment, it's a bit sloppy. However, it's quite fun uh, to try to figure it out with what that is available now. Yeah, the guy who told me this, he said the biggest frustration was that there was a speaker on the other side of the world who went way over his allotted time and there was no way they could get him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think it's time for you to share your screen with us and give us your presentation, uh, your idea that could change the world in the next 15 years. Let's see, great. Good. All right, so thanks again for inviting us to this and happy birthday, Dizian. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, well, we might start with uh, just explaining a little bit that during the past uh, six years uh, or so, most of our work has been concerned with the emergence of virtual environments into the mainstream and what implications this has on culture, design, and human experience. Today, we are going to talk about the way we move between spaces in 
let's say the metaverse, we prefer to call it virtual environment or immersive internet, but yeah, let's use common words uh, here that hopefully everyone understands. And why it is important that as many people as possible gets involved in the enormous challenge uh, to imagine and create a teleportation infrastructure for the virtual environment, a way to move between worlds. We will present an idea for a new kind of virtual portal based on the material behavior of textiles as a universal means to move through the virtual environment, as well as eight propositions for civic teleportation infrastructure in virtual environments. In our view, all representation media like painting or photography can create a, a virtual environment, whether it is digital or not. However, most of these media um, are experienced with only one or two senses and are removed from the body. As digital media gains a third dimension through immersive technology, and we actually step inside the medium, our cultural, political, and experiential understanding of how we access and navigate spaces is challenged. The coming 15 years uh, will see the weaving of physical and virtual environments become denser as our scrolls turn into strolls and our cursor grows into a full body avatar. Rather than swapping pages uh, when we switch tabs or click a link, we instead replace the entire environment around us. And the speed and manner in which these shifts happen, uh, as well as the gesture that would trigger them, uh, are at once the affordance and the infrastructure for accessing and navigating the virtual environment. So we think that in the coming 15 years, we should create a civic infrastructure for teleportation, for traveling between worlds, and that this infrastructure should break with the opaque nature of locked doors, of hidden vigilance and privacy breaches, uh, and conceal discrimination that uh, sadly we find now in some of these worlds. Common, commonly referred to as portals, one of the most popular means to switch from one environment to another are door-like or hole-like thresholds that grant us an entrance into another virtual environment of any kind of any size. Such uh, traveling devices have existed for centuries in oral histories, literature, film, gaming, uh, and naturally now in, a, in immersive media. The portal provides a familiar means to link environments that would otherwise be completely incomprehensible to us. And during the past two years, we have been studying the portal through time and across media. And this research will be presented in our upcoming solo exhibition, the Portal Galleries at the Sir John Sun Museum in London, opening in June, 2022. We believe that analyzing and categorizing fictional portals will make us more uh, cautious and reflective when designing the portals of the virtual environment that is currently well underway. In our work, we have been considering the notion of the portal from various perspectives. Um, several of our proposals envision portals in civic spaces, such as this one in a public road. Uh, in 2020, we worked on a project for the neighborhood of Beacon Tree in London, proposing to organize the creation of what we call Beacon Twin, which is the virtual twin of that area. And uh, Beacon Twin would be co-created and managed by people living there, allowing them to anticipate and take a stand uh, on the inevitably augmented future of their neighborhood. But while Beacon Twin could be accessed through various devices, we envisioned these sort of mobile portals that would provide early windows into this other realm for those who are not yet familiar with the notion of augmentation or that don't have access um, to, to devices of other kind. In the same spirit, we developed the Gate of Bright Lights, a video installation that envisioned spatial access to mainstream chatting, dating, or image sharing apps as spatial portals, which in the 21st century are increasingly replacing the physical portals, which previously defined where we could go and what we could do. And even our logo, which we have had since we formed the practice in, in 2013, is also a portal. It's an opening into an uncertain future um, and framed by our principle and aims. So currently traveling between two these spaces on the internet is often done extremely efficiently uh, through hyperlinks, as you see here, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with. 
But in the 3D internet spaces, uh, where you often have a body and travel through space, much like you do in physical reality, there is at the moment, I would say, uh, no good solution for how to travel between places. Adding to this problem is the fact that uh, virtual environments are existing within uh, centralized platforms that create isolated islands that are sort of fortresses and don't communicate with one another. So while some platforms might have good solutions uh, to teleport between environments that are contained within the platform, moving from one platform to another is a whole other journey that takes us uh, through some kind of app store where you have to scroll very uncomfortably through a browser-like interface uh, in these virtual displays that are floating around you. And once we press on one of them, uh, and usually after a prompt and some darkness, you end up in a new place all of a sudden. This brings us to the main issues we have concerning concerning with this. Firstly, the fact that most immersive environments are currently contained within several layers of commercially driven platforms. And secondly, the instability and unreliability conveyed by the means of access. Uh, you might not, not be granted access and never know why, or the environment might switch off uh, as a result of something completely out of your control. Um, the means of teleportation across the virtual environment must therefore eventually become a coherent protocol, a three-dimensional version of a hyperlink in the form of a portal that at once grants access to an environment as well as the necess necessary information about it. Such infrastructure much must coexist outside private or commercial entities and be of civic character, a public and open protocol that weaves together environments into a virtual urban fabric, the fabric of civic teleportation. Initiatives such as Omni or Open Metaverse Interoperability Group are working to get companies to open up and create bridges between uh, competing virtual environments uh, and one can become a member of Omni through this website. And the standards for the future portals will be just as important as their design experience and functionality. Um, right? So we, what we bring forward is an idea for how such an infrastructure should be and how it could feel. Um, we have spent a lot of time working on portals, uh, both on our own work, uh, but also with students across the world. We wanted to mention here, for example, this beautiful uh, project uh, by Eva Wang. Uh, we've been togetherness that she developed uh, in 2021 under our tutorship. And what we propose is a threaded net network of textiles that um, our virtual avatars, our virtual selves pull aside to move between one environment and the other. We have worked with textiles for nearly a decade uh, through designs for music festival stages, exhibitions, uh, ceremonial clothing and events. And uh, this project Threaded Thresholds uh, brings our research and experimentation together into a proposal for a sort of meaningful, joyful and, and useful portal uh, between environments. So the textile portals only become apparent once we aim and touch them, pulling apart in midair the environment in which we are um, accessed from another. Thus they are parallax tapestries that on closer inspection, reveal uh, through the quality of their threads, the conditions of the space behind them, which we agree to uh, once we cross that threshold. And uh, the following are the eight propositions uh, for a threaded portal infrastructure for the uh, virtual environment. And we're gonna present them now. We believe that this infrastructure should be, first of all, consistent, uh, stable, reliable, dependable, and certain that the way we move uh, through the virtual environment must provide reliable and dependable spaces of access, which do not change with every update. Communities require a certain degree of stability and certainty to be built upon. Readable, relatable, symbolic. The portals to, the, to and across virtual environments must contain information about the space behind them, which are vi widely legible. This will require the creation of a new grammar of material behaviors, graphics, and signs to be incorporated across all access points. It should be shared, network, interconnected. The portals to virtual environments must be interconnected and consistent throughout, appearing the same to all citizens of the virtual environment at any given time. 
because we must perceive the same as each other if we are to understand this space as a shared space uh, and if we are to understand the group of people within it as a community. Inclusive, transparent, fair. In virtual environments, discrimination, inequality and injustice will be possible in completely new and less transparent ways than that we are already experiencing today. Owners of virtual environments are capable of using biometric data and other personal information to determine if access is restricted or refused. We must build transparent civic systems of access to the virtual environment where discrimination becomes visible and therefore can be addressed. Civic, and public and communal. And currently uh, the browser uh, is the unquestionable access point right, the place where it all begins of your journey into your virtual stroll across the internet. And the fact that most browsers are owned and operated by for-profit companies means that from that very first step, we are entering a commercial realm. We think that the means of navigating, which is what we propose with these portals, must operate as a civic infrastructure um, for the benefit of its citizens. Cheap, efficient, affordable, sustainable. The calculations involved in bringing us from one virtual place to another and allowing us to stroll through options must be computationally efficient and consume as little energy as possible. The environmental impact of virtual spaces should also be part of the information communicated to the citizens of the virtual environment as a point of entry. And interoperable, compatible and open. Uh, like the hyperlink is integral to the World Wide Web as we know it, and um, so far is experienced in its flat version through screens. But this like underlined blue text or the sort of button-like graphic that we click on uh, takes on a third dimension and becomes a portal that we enter. And in doing so, such portals uh, must, be, must be based on protocols that are able to exchange and make use of information across spaces such as the hyperlink does. And finally, woven threaded interlinked. The portals across virtual environments must be able to express how they are woven together, showing threads to other places and revealing the knitted network they are, are part of. The expression of such portal must also be familiar and cognitively coherent with our only three-dimensional frame of reference, the built environment. Fabric provides several qualities to achieve all of these. And that's why we propose it to be fabric. It provides a versatile affordance. Fabric can be any shape and size without appearing distorted or exaggerated or unrealistic like a door would. It also provides an inviting metaphor. Um, a curtain can demarcate space um, while not locking it. So as opposed to a door, it provides a sort of welcoming threshold to cross while still perceiving it as a threshold. And it also provides a canvas for information. This is the thing that we've been talking about where we understand knitting and embroidery of a tapestry as code that provides many layers in which both figurative, uh, but also abstracted information can be read prior to accessing the environment behind it as opposed to the usual prompt or that you need to agree to now when you enter virtual spaces. And most importantly, Fabric brings with it perhaps the, the, the richest haptic library of all materials. So we would actually uh, like to conclude stepping back in the realms of touch and uh, show a few uh, samples of actual fabrics opening here. <laughs> um, I'm here opening a, a fabric portal into <laughs> yeah. our little fabric archive. And this is a sort of archive of uh, almost like most of the exhibitions that we have done where we see um, some of the fabrics we have created uh, that are that work together or that come together with uh, virtual experiences. Uh, this is a prototype that we developed with Elementa in Norway um, that is sort of a base for an augmented upholstery. It's, it's almost like a stage for theater pieces to appear augmented on this tapestry. Um, here there is uh, another piece of fabric that, uh, that we developed for the Tallinn Biennale with, uh, in 2019 together with Yael Reisner and many more. Here is the first one we produced for Stoberg's that in London curated by Amy Croft, um, the Wonder Wall uh, that was looking at or like building the environment of uh, German expressionism and so on and so forth. <laughs> Hey, so that's that's um, that's your show and tell 
finished. Thank you <laughs> yes, so much. Absolutely. Let me, sorry. Um, I must admit, this is one of the more complex manifestos, and I think I've um, struggled to understand some elements of it. So these portals, will they be on screens or in the real world or, or somewhere between the two? So literally the way that we just demonstrated it here using a several decade old technology of green screen, that literally if we were in this room that we're in, in here now in this kind of strange open square in some virtual environment. And we were uh, avatars. We are right? avatars we're and we see each it. other in you this just... way, but we can interact with each other physically. Mm. With some physically and others physically. And if we are in this place and we decide let's go to our archive or let's go to another area completely, then I would just reach out anywhere in space and just open up that portal. And it could be and here or in front of us or on the table here or even in front of another person. So these portals would then be able to appear actually anywhere your fingers or whichever other input mechanism you, you have. They are like triggered by intention. So as opposed to you having to pull up a button on a browser, uh, you would suddenly tap into the invisible but always uh, present fabric of the World Wide Web and eventually being able to pull it apart in whichever part you pick uh, to go into and just pull that, uh, that would recreate the behavior um, of fabrics. And I think we mentioned briefly that we have considered and designed several other options for how portals might work. The most obvious would be like literal doors, but we think doors are too rigid and they take up space as they swing and they also communicate uh, exclusion and Locked. doors can be locked, etc. cetera. Um, and they communicate power in a kind of collective understanding. We also consider things like gas or steam or even liquids or other forms or even the simple i mean the or even other like transitions almost like slide transitions where uh, the environment in which you are starts to disappear and the other one starts to appear but that always takes you through this strange moment of like being in nothingness um which we think is co cognitively sort of uh a bit challenging or like you're constantly being reminded that anything could disappear any minute or like in in movies such as monty python and the holy grail where a thunderbolt comes from the sky or something like that and you disappear in a cloud of smoke <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but so but um so i understand that you're trying to create a protocol for a, a kind of uh, a way of getting from one place to another place but how would you trigger that protocol would there need to be an agreed hand gesture or something like that or, or a movement or a yeah, yes. it, go, it will go from, from levels, different layers. So we're part of this um, Omni group of, for metaverse interoperability that are working to actually build code and actual standards for this future internet that everything else will be built upon. So that will be fundamental, that there's basically a new type of, uh, of very fundamental code that this is, that this is operating from. I mean, we're attending their, their sessions. Uh, and then taking it in, in and as designers trying to figure out like, well, how should something like this feel as opposed to, uh, or like on top of how it should um, operate and uh, technically uh, how it needs to be built, but then how does it feel? How do you actually do it? Yeah. So this idea for, for using textiles is just as designers and having some experience with thinking about virtual environments, it's the best we can think about of all the options we have, but it will logically result in a myriad of different ways to move through virtual environments where we think the most important thing is that it's built on, on civic principles and not then yeah. that this code is owned by one company uh, that is then controlled by possibly one human. Yeah. yeah. So it's not only the physical design of the portals you're thinking about, but also that the behaviors the norms like almost like a highway code for for the metaverse kind of thing where everyone agrees to follow the same rules so there's no crashes yeah exactly and and that's why this is almost like a call for we believe that there will be probably people uh, that would be incredible uh, to work with uh, on that aspect as well no? like how do you start developing these proposals for uh, infrastructure that, that needs to be run as a a civic infrastructure, and that is a huge question when it comes to the internet. Because then, what do you do? It feels a little bit like following the like 
civic in the sense of like run by each country will probably not be the solution. And how does one decentralize that without falling into the trope of like anything decentralized, anything blockchain is perfect and it solves all problems, which perhaps it, it doesn't, right? So we think that a lot of planners, uh, people that works uh, yeah, with uh, setting up regulations, people that works with governments and so on, uh, it would be great if they would start getting involved now um, at the very early stages. Uh, as opposed to later on, try to um, regulate what is already kind of gone wild, <laughs> which is what's happening with things like social media and so on. Yeah, and of course, the internet itself, or, or the, the code behind the internet, is a, is a series of decisions, a, a series of of protocols. And it's interesting the point you make about you know the hyperlink. It's such a simple, it's such a simple thing. And and when you when I first came across hyperlinks, it was such a profound experience. But still, 20, 30 years later, we're still looking for little bits of blue underlined text, aren't we? It's kind of the experience is kind of very, very basic. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting. Someone made that decision, right? And then like, well, we can also make buttons now. And that's like, great. Yeah. But, but it, it's super efficient, uh, as we were saying. And it's almost, I mean, I think every now and then we have to appreciate the miracle that there is that things, the basic things of the internet are actually... Um, they have been open source uh, and not owned. I mean, like the way the internet works itself, the fact that that didn't become uh, a private entity is, pff, I mean, how lucky we were. Then a lot of terrible things have been built within it. Um, but I think that must be appreciated that we find the hyperlink very interesting because yeah, it's, it's pretty much remained exactly the same, right? So that means that from the very beginning, we better establish or like think a little bit about its design because once we get used to it, it's very hard to change it or there's almost no point perhaps, or I guess it's really hard to then like, okay, let's retrain everybody to now do it differently because we cannot even think about how to do it differently. It just becomes a part of how you operate. It's like yeah. now you try and walk differently. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's interesting how the design of the internet has evolved though, because in the early days, every link shouted for attention. It had some ridiculous gif it had some everything was in a different color it was like it was like every website was a fruit salad wasn't it and 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 now gradually it's all calmed down quite a lot you know when when google went for its sort of flat design and then facebook got rid of a lot of all the layers of colors and skeuomorphism has sort of had its day that the internet is becoming quite a kind of calm and classical or bauhaus kind of space that's absolutely true, actually. It relates to one of the propositions about the, the future of virtual environments being readable, or that, you, that you can read and understand what there is. And that's, we speak a lot about and think a lot about the issues around why virtual environments look similar to the real world, or to physical environments, and specifically with this, with this point, that if you are going to use something, then you need to be able to experience it, usually look at it or touch it, and somehow with previous knowledge, understand how this new thing might behave based on previous knowledge. So um, we will see, and we're already seeing this kind of quite exciting, but chaotic design world now of, of the metaverse, where there's a lot of experimentation and a lot of mess and a lot of really uh, terrible spaces to actually use, where, as we showed a slide here, where if you're in a environment and you're operating an avatar then you're often zooming out to look at a screen to cho choose where to go or what to do with your avatar etc which then the layout of those things it's a completely new realm and we're copying uh, our understanding of designing uh, digital environments uh, flat interfaces on the internet to learn how to do that and we see a similar kind of chaotic screaming gif sort of uh, face at the moment where because there are so many people already working on this and there will be just like on the internet, you know, the countless people that have built their life around designing spaces on the internet, um, there will be the same. And then probably we'll find some method that, that clicks, that makes it livable and not just a kind of commercial screaming space for products. Mm -hmm. You gave the example of portals from, from movies. So we, so we are used to that idea that the movies figured out how to show someone going from one reality into another, like in Stargate, for example, usually involve passing through some like vertical water or some plasma screen 
or or something like that, which was which was very clever actually. You we got used didn't got used to the idea that you could do that, even though it's currently impossible. Hmm. And this is really important for us. I mean, we're developing this research that leading to um, or like that we we will will be published um, through our exhibition uh, at the Sound Museum in 2022 where we think it's really important that we start to understand that history, almost create the history of portals in fiction in the past blah, blah years. Uh, and um, the thing is that like, we have gotten so used to reading about it or seeing it in movies, but we have never experienced it in the flesh. So most of those techniques, most of those transitions and portals, if you actually build them in, in a virtual reality environment and experience them are incredibly disorienting or they might even make you dizzy or just weird or too sudden, or maybe some of them are great. But we need to do that exercise, right? As opposed to assuming that some of those are gonna work. And obviously those are our reference point, right? So inevitably designers are gonna use those. Um, what we are trying to do is to create um, this categorization and this large study, we have a same database with over 900 of them, uh, trying to understand what do they do, uh, but also why have they been created in the first place? Because we cannot separate them from the narrative that they serve. And often the narrative they are serving uh, needs them, these portals, to be a device of exclusion or uh, a device that yeah, keeps some people out and makes other people more special because they can go in. Right? So, Wait a second, then, if we are going to use this portal and that was created precisely for uh, excluding uh, and creating these barriers, is that really what we want to do? And yeah, that is the reason uh, why we are, think that developing this research could be actually quite important. And I understand that, you know, if you've got a, one private company that owns this chunk of the metaverse and another private company over here that owns a different chunk to get from one to the other, will involve um, some kind of um, checking out who you are, but will, will you need like a, a passport? Will you need a, a COVID test to get from <laughs> A to B? Will it all be done automatically? Will you have to stand in line while someone checks your papers? Yeah, if, that, if people, <laughs> people think that it's, it's uh, difficult to imagine a world with, uh, with identity numbers or identity cards and think that's tricky, this is going to be this is a much more challenging reality because more and more the things that we actually care about is virtual content. If we group together all of our social media accounts together and we ask ourselves, how much is this worth to you? All of the data, all of your interaction connections that then would be linked to some form of digital identity, then it's very, very important that this gets done right. And there is a lot of organizations and nonprofits um, and organizations that are working on this is commonly referred to as self-sovereign identity. It is a real project that people are trying to resolve. Basically, a kind of uh, a way to identify you uniquely in a virtual environment so that you can bring things from one virtual environment to another. That could be the simple thing as the things your avatar wears, but also literally who you are and, and uh, your privacy settings, etc. Mm. But it, it, and it is something that both, um, as we said, nonprofit organizations are interested in working on, but increasingly also these big and sometimes terrible companies, they also have an incentive to get this right because they realize that you know, the way that even markets work, the more different markets can connect with each other, the better it is for the individual markets. So, and this will happen at such a high level and there is currently no one protesting outside any government buildings about this. Now this is happening quietly at a high level and whatever they decide, we will have to live with for decades. So if, if anything, we're just trying to kind of create some awareness that just when you see the first article about this, you know, this, this is something that we need to keep in mind and somehow be prepared to even conceptualize a little bit. Yeah, yeah and to, to understand that um, creating this identity is, is not because uh, for surveillance purposes, I mean, that could be the motivation behind the companies, but probably we will all want that identity to be able to be ours and for us to be able to take it through with us because that's how environments and relationships become actually meaningful, no? when you are you and there is a value to that and there is a relationship established. So it doesn't come from just uh, companies wanting to do that, but it will be probably us wanting to do that. And then 
whoever, whichever platform provides that, we will probably gravitate towards that. And if we're not critical of it, or if we're not aware of what is it doing with that identity, uh, then we run into troubles like the ones we are seeing today. And I imagine that the, for the landlords of these chunks of metaverse real estate, the main thing they want you to take with you is, is your credit card or your your crypto wallet. I guess. Yeah, yeah. And for all of the uh, uh, biometric data to be readable across so that uh, everything from eye, eye tracking and other forms of biometric data can be tracked back to the original original marketplace. And that's, of course, where the interests of these big companies clash completely with what we are arguing for a civic infrastructure. Um, and that is going to take a real fight where there are very few players in the world that are strong enough to actually put up a fight. You know, you have ideally people, citizens through protest and action, action and, and activism. It doesn't seem likely to happen at least in the next five or 10 years because there's so little awareness yet. And the other being things like the UN and other big international organizations like that, or even Amnesty, et cetera. Uh, and the other would be a conglomerate of nations, other forms of you have the EU or other forms of, of agreements that could be strong enough to force these companies to do this in a way where, where whatever data needs to be tracked for these environments to actually work is not going to be used to monetize your entire life, which is a very real possibility if this is not done correctly. Yes, and of course, I mean, as you pointed out earlier, that we're very lucky that the internet was built as a sort of open source project. That's that. There's talk about that being eroded already or constantly being chipped away at. But is, does the metaverse? Is there any hope that the metaverse can be a place where we can actually be free of those kind of things? If you talk about um, a civic infrastructure and compare it to the the real world, you. You know, there's a shop and you know that's a transactional space and then there's a restaurant, but then you have the street. And so all of the connections between those spaces is sort of um, as free as you can get, really. Or then you can go off to the woods behind the shops and there not be any any rules at all. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, um, there is hope There are uh, open source, quite a lot of open source uh, initiatives um, and uh, platforms uh, where where the strongest communities are are actually even if they are privately owned are quite open uh, like for example VR chat but then open source initiatives uh, like Mozilla Hubs now that it becomes is quite uh, readily available and usable by almost anyone is completely open source you literally download their whole stack and develop your own thing and, and that's it and you might I mean it's, it's, uh, it's really fantastic so that's why we are paying a lot of attention uh, or trying to pay a lot of attention to these groups, uh, mostly groups of engineers and developers um, that are putting heart and soul on, on, on trying to provide these alternatives and, uh, and, and putting our trust in them, basically using them, right? And the more we use them and the more people can create interesting spaces within them, uh, well, the more the likelihood there is that uh, they will become the, the thing that we, we opt uh, for. At the moment, people say the internet's been chipped away. It's not the internet. It's the way we choose. It's what, which websites we choose to go to on the internet. We must not forget that all of these things are just websites. Google is just a website within the internet. The internet overall is still there, miraculously being not messed up with somehow. Um, but it is our choice. No? And uh, I think it's important to reflect on well, why do we choose uh, these platforms and not others, not hate ourselves for that. We probably choose them because it's where we find this kind of meaningful identity. So the issue that, that Freddie was mentioning before, super important, right? So if we reflect a little bit and trying to understand what are the things that are really giving us value and how do we want those things to happen, then maybe we can start making the right decisions and start maybe asking for things to be made in the right way uh, a little bit earlier uh, than we have done with the phenomenon of, um, of social media. And finally, to, to go off on a slight tangent, obviously um, this Dazine 15 festival is going on at the same time as the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. How does the metaverse respond to climate change? Is it a place where people go to escape from climate change and, and stop worrying about it? 
Um, is it a place where we'll be almost like a kind of safe haven where climate change can't touch us? Or it, it, we know that the internet has an increasingly big carbon footprint itself, which is bigger than aviation now. What is the, what is the role of the metaverse in dealing with that, that huge problem? Or is it the, the alternative to that huge problem? No, I think this is where, um, which is sort of beyond beyond us uh, as a small design studio, but this is where it has to be data driven. And there's a lot of data that is not maybe so accessible, but we think that generally there's a quite good understanding that like a street light in, a, in the metaverse uses real ele electricity, right? Like in the things we do and, and the amount of, even if our photographs on our phones are shot in color or not has an impact on, on energy use and um, it will obviously be incredibly important that it that this is done in a way um, that is as cheap as possible is one of the um, one of the uh, propositions we put forward because there are ways to create experiences and fulfill the sort of um, desired experience that you might want um, without using excessive amount of of, uh, of data or, or and of um, therefore of energy um, but it is something that is it's currently not really woven in to the way we really think about it and that's why also one of the propositions mentions that if we use something like fabrics as a metaphor for how we navigate mm -hmm. then those fabrics mm -hmm. should have embroidered in in them the motifs of what they cost uh, for for the environment and that if that is a kind of legible and readable diagram that we get used to it's always there you can't erase it then it becomes part of like every time you open a door or open a portal draw a curtain in, in the metaverse you are reminded you get a visual impression of what it costs so you you then inform your decisions based on that and that's something that's very difficult to do with you know you have printed labels on plastic bottles etc but uh, the kind of constant reflection and mirror um, of the things we do in physical reality is very very difficult where the metaverse has a great potential possibility to to communicate that back to us as, as gates historically used to do you know the great gates to incredible spaces used to tell a little bit of what was behind them amazing I think to end up, could you just do that trick one more time where you lift up like <laughs> like a like roadrunner? I wish, we, I wish we set this up a bit better so we can actually disappear. But... <laughs> we can... Yeah, so I was going to say, do you think if you can... Goes, this is our library. <laughs> he just, the, the legs stick out. I guess because in the metaverse, you maybe only have a torso, not like in Facebook. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that was, that was amazing. That was like the first live demonstration of what the portal of the future could Bring be like look. you just need to fix it so your legs go with you as well yeah <laughs> Keep it, leave the legs <laughs> sometimes works brilliant lara frederick thank you so much for your time an amazing idea i think that we're going to have to process over the, the coming days but thank you so much for not only coming up with the idea but demonstrating it to us as well <laughs> thank you so much thank marcus you. and Dizine for inviting us and happy birthday again <laughs> yeah. thank you very much hope to see you soon bye see you